All of these are legitimate reasons to stop singing music from these groups. But they are not the most important reason you should stop. The biggest reason you should stop singing songs from Hillsong, Bethel, Jesus Culture, and Elevation is that All things theology, all things theology, we chop it up properly without an apology. Gotta get that theology to God, hallowed because this is how we do it at All Things Theology. Yo, grace and peace, and welcome back to another episode of All Things Theology, where this is your host, K-Dub. Today, in this video, I want to go come to you to talk about why Christians shouldn't listen to artists, music, bands, such as Bethel Music, Jesus Culture, and other movements. Going to be playing a lot of clips from content from Scott Onyo. Scott Onyo is connected with G3 Ministries. By the way, you want to be at the G3 conference for 2025. I'll put a link in the description. But yeah, let's go on. Let's go do that. Let's see some of his reasoning why these movements are actually dangerous because of their doctrine. But let, let, let's let's get into it. There's no question about it. Hillsong, Bethel, Jesus Culture, and Elevation have become a global phenomenon and you should stop singing their music. I could give many reasons why you should stop singing or listening to music from these groups. I could point out the prosperity gospel advocated by leaders within these movements, such as Bethel Church Pastor Bill Johnson, who argues that Jesus did not perform miracles as God. Quote, if he performed miracles because he was God, then they would be unattainable for us. But if he did them as man, I am responsible to pursue his lifestyle." Unquote. Hillsong's Brian Houston just comes right out and says it. Quote, you need more money. Unquote. <laughs> so essentially what Scott is getting to right here is uh, the troubling theology that comes from these movements um, and why they're problematic. Again, the what many people say, hey, look, well, it's just music. Well, the, the, the music leads people back to their theology, back to their churches like Bethel, to uh, Hillsong. And so people listen to the music and then they start listening to the sermons. Right. And so this is why it is problematic. But Scott's going to go on to explain further some problems in these movements. I could cite theological concerns with leaders such as Stephen Furtick, of Elevation Church, mm -hmm. who appears to believe in the heresy of modalism, which teaches that God is not three persons, but one being who manifests himself in different modes. Mm. Or Bethel's Bill Johnson, who taught that Jesus had to go to hell and be tortured for three days before being born again. Mm. I could reference the charges of sexual abuse that have plagued leaders from Hillsong. I could address Hillsong pastor Brian Houston's questionable views of gay marriage. I could give examples of theologically vague lyrics. Before we get into that, um, let me let me actually scoot back so because I want to touch on that. What you're seeing is the a problem in theology that is orthodoxy and practice that is orthopraxy. They have troubling uh, on both sides of the matter. And again, the music is centered around all this. I want to get to this vague lyrics aspect because much of the lyrics. Uh, and this is a problem in CCM, Christian music as a whole, that much of the music can really be applied to your boyfriend or your girlfriend and much of it, right? It's actually not, the music is not transcendent enough that it can be applied only to Christ, right? Again, I have much of, you know, you know, much of lyrics today that's like, man, is this your girlfriend? I mean, again, very interesting, right? Brian Houston's questionable views of gay marriage. I could give examples of theologically vague lyrics or theologically questionable lyrics. I could highlight the charismatic Pentecostal theology of these groups often manifested in their lyrics. Mm -hmm. I could point out that when you buy their albums or sing their music, you are financially supporting questionable theology at best and heretical theology at worst. I could caution that when you sing their music in church, weaker Christians might listen to other songs from these groups and mm -hmm. be influenced by their poor theology. All of these are legitimate reasons to stop singing music from these groups, but they are not the most important reason you should stop. That's interesting, right? That is interesting. He brought up some various important reasons why you shouldn't listen to Bethel, Hillsong, right? And theological concerns like connections to the prosperity gospel, New Apostolic Reformation, 
bad practice that happens in, oftentimes in these churches. And Scott ends that with, you know, with a with a hammer saying, well, that's actually not the most important reason why you should listen to them. I'm like, hold on, Scott. You got to explain. He's going to do just that. The biggest reason you should stop singing songs from Hillsong, Bethel, Jesus Culture, and Elevation is that their music embodies a false theology of worship. Okay. All right. So Scott's claim is much of these movements have a false theology of worship. Matter of fact, I have a book from Scott that I want to recommend to you, and it is Change from Glory Unto Glory into glory the liturgical story of the christian faith it's written by scott onyel g3 ministries by the way you want to be at g3 2025 scott will be there etc etc scott argues in this book uh just for a proper view of biblical worship also there's a great book called strange liar i actually bought when i was uh from their table g3 when i went to the reformation conference and it's about the pentecostalization of worship. We're about to talk about that because I agree fully with this statement that much of worship has been Pentecostalized negatively, right? But let's let's talk about it. let's see what we mean. Let's let's chop it up. Let's want to hear your thoughts about this. Praise and worship liturgy is centered around the emotional flow of the music. Mm-hmm. Worship leaders are encouraged to begin with enthusiastic songs of thanksgiving leading the worshipers to an emotional, soulish worship, Mm -hmm. and then bringing the mood to an intimate expression where, quote, a gentle, sustained chord on the organ and a song of the spirit on the lips of the leaders should be more than sufficient to carry a worship response of the entire congregation for a protracted period of time, unquote. What Scott really got into there in a large kind of mouthful statement was the Setting the atmosphere, you might have even heard that kind of language from much of charismatic worship is we got to set the atmosphere, get the mood right. And much of it is is going to much of it leads to a show. Right. You don't need to set the atmosphere for God. God can go into any atmosphere as he pleases. God is delighted in the voices of his saints, of his people. Uh, There's no certain atmosphere that draws God in more. Matter of fact, when the people gather That's when God is drawn with his people. But nevertheless, let's keep hearing this. Zach Hicks suggests, quote, Part of leading a worship service's flow involves keeping the awareness of God's real abiding presence before his worshipers. As all of the elements of worship pass by, the one constant, the true flow, is the presence of the Holy Spirit himself, unquote. This kind of flow, according to Hicks, quote, lies in understanding and guiding your worship service's emotional journey, unquote. Mm -hmm. Grouping songs in such a way that they flow together, worship leader Carl Tuttle explains, is essential to a good worship experience. Yeah, this is another issue as well, right? You have to have the the mood set right. So even everything's become actually... um, it's it's a show. It's a flow rather than just expressing worship to God. And again, I, I don't think we're being nitpicky, but th- they do it to serve a certain emotionalism. Now, I'm of the assertion, I think Scott agrees, he's going to express this later. True worship will bring out the emotions, but that's not the goal. The goal is to worship God. Right. The worship is not for the worshiper. You ever heard some you know, people say, man, I really enjoyed worship today or oh, I, did, I didn't really enjoy worship. Well, that's OK, because none of it was for you anyway. Right. It's it's no concern if we enjoy the worship. We have to do it biblically. Right. And, and make sure God enjoys the worship according to scripture. That's why the pattern should be scripture. And Ruth described the earliest guides written to help worship leaders achieve flow one of which is David Blomgren's 1978, The Song of the Lord. He says, quote, The flow should move continuously with no interruptions. The flow should move naturally using connections from song's content, keys, and tempos. And the flow should move toward a goal of a climactic experience of true worship of God. Blomgren spelled out technical aspects for achieving proper flow. Quote, The content of the songs and sequence makes sense, having scriptural and thematic relatedness. The key signatures are conducive to easy, unjarring, and smooth transitions between songs. 
the tempos of the songs, usually faster to slower overall, with songs having similar tempos grouped, contributing to a growing sense of closer encounter with God. This now, what Scott is really getting to much is, is is setting the mood, setting the flow to down to the point where the songs have to be uh, catered to 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 invoke a certain mood or emotion that the certain speaker or worshiper is wanting to um, portray, wanting they're desiring to obtain from the audience. Again, true worship does not have to be. Uh, True worship is organic. Let me say like that. It's not malfunction. You know, you don't have to, uh, you know, cater it up. Yeah, just we play the songs, right, that that are God honoring and let the Lord do as he pleases, so to speak. Theology of worship is a distinct break from the theology and expectation of Reformed Christians in the wake of the Reformation until the rise of American revivalism in the 19th century and Pentecostalism in the 20th century. Scott gets in this gets into that into this in this book here, and this is why you definitely want to check it out. It gets into uh, a history of liturgy, uh, liturgy. Um, and how different uh, movements have uh, viewed worship. Again, it's not something we just, it's not not a light thing to go into the presence and worship God, right? <laughs> it is a uh, fearful and wonderful thing. And when I say fearful, not just, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful, amazing, I'm using old language right there, but it's, it is, it is, it should provoke unworthiness, right? Not, again, that's why we, I believe we, we should be having a high view of worship, not a low um, man-centered view of worship. So, Worship theology that was reformed according to scripture taught that emotion and singing come as a result of the work of the Holy Spirit in a believer's life. That's right. Not as a cause of the Holy Spirit's work. That's right. Calvin Stapert helpfully makes this point with reference to Ephesians 5, 18 and 19 and Colossians 3, 16. Quote, Spirit filling does not come as the result of singing. Rather, spirit filling comes first. Singing is the response. Yeah, let me actually read Colossians 3.16. It says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. First of all, it's all about the word. Let the word dwell in you, teaching, admonishing one another in all wisdom, right? So there's a teaching aspect, even in our songs, right? Even in all this. So, so admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs with thankfulness in our hearts to God. So the, the, the emotion is evoked in portraying right worship unto God, his, his word, esteeming him worthy, esteeming him as he truly is, right? It's not just, just singing lyrics and songs we like. Like we, we need to bring back a high view of worship. Let's get it. Clear as these passages are in declaring that Christian singing is a response to the word of Christ, and to being filled with the Spirit, it is hard to keep from turning the cause and effect around. Music, with its stimulating power, can too easily be seen as the cause mm. and the Spirit filling as the effect. Mm -hmm. Such a reading of the passages, Stapert argues, gives song an undue epicletic function and turns it into a means of beguiling the Holy Spirit." Unquote. He argues that such a magical epicletic function characterized pagan worship music, not Christian. The Holy Spirit works in a believer's heart through the sufficient word that he inspired and the ordinary means of grace that he prescribed therein. He used the big word. Let's define our terms, right? Uh, epicletic or epiclesis uh, from the Greek word. Uh, it really means a liturgical invocation of the Holy Spirit for the purpose of consecrating, consecrating the Eucharistic elements found particularly in Eastern liturgies. It's used, you know, generally a uh, Eastern Orthodox practice uh, or Roman Catholic practice where they believe that uh, worship actually invokes God, brings him down, so to speak. No, we don't need to have a as Scott said, a pagan view of worship, because this is how the pagans viewed worship, where if we just worship hard enough, if we worship actually even a certain way, then God will, the gods will come down unto us. We don't have a Christian view of uh, epiclesis, right? No, the Bible does not teach this, right? Again, um, when God people gather, he's with them, right? 
Again, I think this is a good actual distinction from much of worship today versus a biblical view of worship. Right. You hear many times of the pastor teaching something along these facts. Right. If you know, if you know, Lord, we call you down. Right. It's in the midst of the worship. Right. No, this is a form of paganism. Again, I hope this is really challenging your views. I mean, this was definitely like, wow, it's caused me right now even to to think about these things uh, as I go to worship next Sunday. And this is what it should be doing. We need to have our mindset on properly worshiping God, because remember, in the Bible, worship is pretty serious. I mean, God literally <laughs> killed someone for improper worship, and we need to be honoring God if that is the case. So one more clip. Let's check it out here. This theology is what music from charismatic groups like Hillsong, Bethel, Jesus Culture, and Elevation embodies. Mm. As sociologist Gerardo Marti notes, quote, Hillsong represents a compelling musical pathway to an emotional one-on-one -on -one connection to God, unquote. Mm, mm. He continues, quote, Hillsong worship involves the hopeful anticipation of the Pentecostal ego motivated to participate in an event-dependent effort, mm. the gathering of worshipers, to surrender oneself with a characteristic openness to God which involves setting aside distractions and letting go that is meant to lead the earnest believer to the deployment of spiritual power, unquote. Mm. And we would expect nothing less. It makes perfect sense that groups with charismatic theology would worship like charismatics. We would disagree with their theology, but we would understand that their worship would flow from that theology. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is when evangelicals who do not affirm or teach charismatic theology worship like charismatics. Yeah. And this has come largely through the music produced by groups like these. Mm. Marty calls this the Hillsongization of Christianity. Mm. This point is critically important to recognize. When you sing music from Hillsong, Bethel, Jesus Culture, and Elevation, you are bringing embodied Pentecostalism into your church. But the lyrics of these songs we're using from these groups don't teach Pentecostal theology, you might reply. Well, maybe, although many of them do in both overt and subtle ways. But again, I'm not talking about the lyrics here. I'm talking about the music. Yeah. The music itself has been carefully designed to create a visceral experience of the feelings that then become evidence of God's manifest presence. Yeah, this is this is a good point. Much of church music today is designed to give you a, an experience to lean on, right? Over and against scripture. You ever seen this where you ask somebody some question and they appeal first and foremost to their experience rather than, than what the Bible says? Well, this person has been caught up into costalization, the hill songization, right, as, as it was used of, of worship, where in worship, the primary focus is the exper to experience something rather than to honor God, despite how we may feel about uh, a, a certain song. You know, th this is why I love hymns, because it's rich in theology. It's rich. And obviously, Again, we're not anti-experience, not anti-feelings, but there's a proper order. The order, first and foremost, honor God despite those feelings. But honest, and, and let's be honest, many times in honoring God rightly, I would argue that's when the true experience, the true feelings are aligned biblically. And that's what we need, a proper order. This fits the sacramental theology of charismatics perfectly, but it does not fit the theology of non-charismatic evangelicals, especially those who consider themselves reformed. And so, I repeat, most of evangelicalism worships like charismatics even if their church's doctrinal statement does not affirm that theology. So true. And here's the thing. What is more potently formative for the people in the pew? Mm. A doctrinal statement on a church's website or how they worship week in and week out. Mm. If you do not want to teach Pentecostal theology to your people, then don't sing Hillsong, Bethel, Jesus Culture, or Elevation. Because when you do, you are shaping your people through embodied theology. Mm. Wait, you might reply. 
Doesn't the music from many other popular contemporary worship artists embody the same sort of charismatic theology? Why, yes. Yes, it does. Let the reader understand. I love the ending there. Yeah, let the reader understand. Yeah, this is, as I, as I said earlier, this is a problem in much of Christendom, unfortunately, and uh, much of uh, the theology and practices of that which claims to be Christian, though they're not charismatic or Pentecostal, much of the way they worship is. I hope this actually has been challenging you, even if you find yourself disagreeing ultimately. I hope it's actually challenged you as how to even think about how we worship. Is it just to go to worship and uh, do these rogue things where it's just, you know, creating this kind of atmosphere and setting the mood right and uh, the transitions got to be right to create a certain atmosphere to that which we call God. I don't see that in the Bible. Rather, we are to worship God rightly, despite all these ancillary uh, side issues and things like that. So again, hope this was challenging you. Remember, always honor God, right? And whatever you do, whatever we, whatever we drink, right? Whatever we eat. Again, the whole Christian life is worship, not just when music comes on. Hope this video, hope, hope you have enjoyed this video. Till the next time, grace and peace. Yo, grace and peace. Thank you for watching another episode of All Things Theology. If you enjoyed what you heard today, go on and give me a like. Subscribe to the channel. Hit that notification bell. I promise to give you weekly lives, videos, interactions, exposing false teachers, sharing with you, the viewer, my theological beliefs, things about the culture, and the Bible. So if you're here for that, come on and join us. Also, if you would like to support this channel financially, you can do so by becoming a Patreon member or a YouTube member. Links are in the description below. You can see content before it drops. You can also have Q&A sessions with also other Patreon members, YouTube members as well. So if you would like that, hit the description link in below. Hey,